Uh, one of the reasons we thought this year we would do Canada Day a little differently was because of really the last year through COVID, through so many different things that have happened um, that has raised the awareness you know, of where we are and who we are um, and also in some sense when we are in Canada. So first off, just want to acknowledge as we do at UBC that we are on the ancestral, traditional, unceded territories of the Musqueam. Behind me you can see a textile that's woven by Musqueam artist Susan Point uh, called Salmon People and above that there's the Musqueam flag. And it's a way of our acknowledging that we are on their territory. Um, but what that means, unceded, is I think also something we could reflect upon because we are in British Columbia on unceded territory. In other parts of Canada there are treaties, there are other ways in which you know uh, settlers have come to Indigenous land. But for Canada overall, colonialism is not in the past. So when you hear people talk about our past, our shameful past, our colonial past, it is not past. I'm a historian. I, you know, that's my professional scholarly specialty is the past. And colonialism is not the past in Canada. And what I mean by that is that there are ongoing structures of colonialism. That we live in a colonial moment that is ongoing. That started when people came from around the world to indigenous territories here. The word unceded means that the indigenous peoples in British Columbia never ceded their territories in any way through conflict, through war, through agreements, through treaties. It was a unilateral claim by the British Crown that this was Crown land, that this is British land, that this is Canadian land. And so when we say unceded territory and when we acknowledge that, we acknowledge the ongoing colonial history of Canada, that we are still living in that history. It's not the past. I think it's important to think about that too when you have these discoveries of the remains of children who were unilaterally sent to residential schools so that their culture and language could be stripped from them. A large number of those children never returned home, never returned to their families, never returned to their communities. The fact that we are now discovering their remains is a part of that erasure of the past that is part of our colonial history and our ongoing colonial society. The shock, you could say, of those discoveries is part of the problem. For all of you who've come from other parts of the world, it's understandable that you may feel shock and surprise, anger, bewilderment at the discovery of these bodies. But no one in Canada who was educated here should feel that shock or that surprise because this is known. This is knowledge that actually has been shared. Indigenous peoples have shared it. The Truth and Reconciliation, Truth and Reconciliation Commission brought this to light. The high mortality rate right, is a, often a term used. That just means death. That means many children were malnourished, were mistreated, were starved, were treated so badly that many decided life was not worth living. Tearing children away from their mothers, fathers, families, their communities, left them often suicidal. Those effects continued after the survivors of that residential schooling system were allowed to leave. They were really prisons versus schools. And I think that's something to think about as we think about words, even like discovery. And I know many of you are researchers. You've come from all around the world to a, a top research university. We think of discovery as a pure good, a discovering a cure, discovering a vaccine for COVID, discovering something that people didn't know before. But discovery also can be a word that masks that colonial history. 
So there is something called the doctrine of discovery. The idea that when Europeans came and discovered the Americas, that therefore it was theirs through discovery. That the fact that people already lived here, that people already had societies that were vibrant, that there were resources that were those peoples. The doctrine of discovery is the basis for the legal claim that the crown, the British crown made, that all of this, just by mapping it and saying that we discovered it, is the British kings. We live with that legacy still. That foundational act of white supremacy, that this discovery meant certain people coming here from other parts of the world, if you were racialized as white, it belonged to you. So the song, O Canada, talks about our native land, literally displacing those who are native to this place, who are indigenous to this place, with a claim that those coming from other places who are white it belonged to them. And we've seen over the past year a surge in anti-Asian violence. We saw in London, Ontario, a horrific killing of a family because whoever was driving that car thought they were Muslim, therefore deserved to be murdered. Anti-Muslim violence, anti-black violence, anti-Asian violence that has surged over the last year during COVID is not caused by COVID. It's not because of COVID that easy scapegoating of non-whites in Canada was the answer to fear, the answer to being upset about the restrictions and the impacts of COVID. Why are Asians targeted? Why are Muslims targeted as outsiders, as not belonging? The foundational nature of colonial white supremacy is our history, it's our present. And so as we reflect on Canada today, you know, reflect on where we are. We are on unceded territory here at UBC campus. It's the unceded traditional territory of Musqueam. At UBC Okanagan, it's the unceded territory of the Okanagan and Silks First Nations. We are uninvited guests. Uninvited because we weren't invited to be here. I'm fourth generation by birth. My great grandfather came here. My grandfather came here. My parents came here. I was born here on the 100th anniversary of Canada. So a Canada Day a special 100th anniversary Canada Day was my birth. I've lived through a third of Canada's history. But my relatives, until really halfway through, were not considered Canadian, could not be considered Canadian. They could not vote. They could not own land. When land was taken from Indigenous peoples, it was not given to non-whites. They could not receive preempted crown land. The struggles to belong, in some sense, are part of the racism that non-white Canadians have struggled with throughout the history of Canada. But that doesn't mean that it's a triumph for me, my family, to belong and to take the investment and success of being here, of getting a good education, of being able to have a good job, of being able to enjoy these resources, we're still uninvited guests. And in some sense, all of you who you know, are here, who have come from other parts of the world, if you would think about what it means to be a guest in someone else's home. When you visit someone and they do show hospitality, do you show up empty handed? Do you, do you bring a snack if you're being fed tea and some food? Would you, would you come and act as a guest and be great, grateful and thankful for the hospitality being shown you? It's not a bad way to understand our own place here if you're not Indigenous. That we have moral traditions, forms of politeness, of how you act when you're in someone else's home. 
especially if that home is a stolen home. So again, if you think of the original act of colonial you know, dispossession and displacement, of taking of land and resources and moving indigenous people onto reserves that are a tiny fraction of the lands that they lived on before, that we are in a house that was stolen. So if you think of stolen goods, you know, if you feel that this is yours, it's like a stereo that was taken from someone else's house, or it's like living in a house that had been taken from someone and they are living now in the backyard in a tiny corner. So those are the ways, as an historian, I would ask all of us to reflect on how to behave as a guest to how to acknowledge that we are on unceded territory, that we are in someone else's house, that we are benefiting from stolen goods. The discovery of those remains of so many, there will be more children's remains discovered. We know they are there. As we find evidence, physical evidence, as in a crime that we know that happened and we're just finding the evidence now. That discovery is not of new knowledge. It's of old knowledge. And in some sense, that is at the heart of racism and colonialism in Canada, is this idea of putting the past in the past as if it doesn't matter. So when you read in newspapers our shameful past, shameful moments in our past, dark moments, what I learned in school growing up here was we used to be racist in Canada, but at some magical moment we stopped. It was never told to us when that magical moment was when we stopped. And that's why surprise and shock and this idea that we didn't know or I'm so surprised that it was so terrible. That knowledge is known. It's known among indigenous peoples. It's shaped their lives. It's shaped our lives as well in Canada, those of us who grew up here. It's just, we don't admit it. We don't acknowledge it. The time, you could say this year, where you could not acknowledge that past has ended. There is a reckoning, and that's when we are in Canada. That reckoning has come upon us, and this is the place that you've come to from all around the world. So, as you reflect upon what it's like to live here, work here, study here, it is a moment of reckoning. And it's not going to end sh shortly. It's going to be a long, difficult, perhaps even painful process. So I hope you're able to be aware of that, to think of yourselves as guests on this land, to think about what is your relationship as uninvited guests on this land and to help actually this society perhaps deal with something. You're at an advantage. I've had to unlearn as a historian much of who I am, where I am, when we are in this place. I've spent my historical research and scholarship trying to unlearn. It's easier, you could say, to not have to unlearn all this information. So if you come from somewhere else, you start with a cleaner slate. So hopefully as you actually learn where you are and who we are in Canada and when we are in Canada, you won't have as challenging a time as those of us who have had to unlearn so much. So yeah, it's not a day for celebrating, for fireworks. It is a day where we can come together though as we always do at St. John's, over food, over chef's barbecue, and perhaps take the time to reflect today and the days to come. I think when I think of racism, it's really important to recognize that uh, each of us have been both victims and perpetrator of racist actions or comments. And that is a really sad, unfortunate like, fact to realize, but I think that's 
actually the truth. And when we think of systematic racism and institutional racism, yes, that is there. But when we think of it, those entities do not exist like by itself. It doesn't stand alone. And actually, us individual people are taking part of these institutions or entities. And one thing I could maybe advise to other people and other international students is it's okay to feel uncomfortable when someone is telling you, hey, that comment you just made is actually based on the unconscious bias. Everyone has the unconscious biases and we grew up with it. But it's, it's okay to feel ashamed. It's okay to feel uncomfortable, but it's actually not about you. Don't take it personally. It's about those people who are affected by those comments and actions made based on those unconscious biases or oppressions. And it's more about how we can avoid those situations to happen so that we can avoid contributing to the harms we are already making to the certain specific group of people from specific cultures and backgrounds. Uh, my name is Nima Jamshidi. I'm doing a master's in resources, environment and sustainability. And my background is in engineering. I come from Iran. Um, it's very important to uh, discuss uh, these matters. Uh, we uh, international students come from many different countries. Uh, when we grew up there, uh, we become familiar with, uh, with the history of that place and uh, many joyful moments and many um, cruel and outrageous uh, incidents. Um, but when we go abroad and go to another place, like here, Canada, uh, it's very important to learn about the history and the uh, uh, culture and, uh, more importantly, uh, the social struggles uh, here uh, so that uh, we can uh, learn about it and uh, then support the uh, causes and uh, be part of the solution. Um, and uh, it, I'm very grateful of uh, these type of discussions, uh, Dr. Henry's speech, and uh, it's important for the uh, students and residents to uh, pay attention and uh, look for more resources about uh, the history and the struggles that many groups, uh, groups of people here, especially indigenous people, uh, many minorities like uh, uh, Asian uh, groups and uh, Muslim groups and many other minorities have, uh, have faced here. And uh, yeah, uh, I, one thing that I wanted to I was looking for uh, how I became familiar with these stuff uh, in Canada before uh, coming to Canada. Uh, I was listening to a podcast. I was trying to find the uh, podcast so that I would suggest it. It was about the history of Canada and especially the dark side of the history. Uh, I couldn't find the name, but I would advise to uh, look for it. My name is Shubham, and I'm a PhD student in Asian Studies. I'm an international student with South Asian background. So when I first moved to Canada in 2018, I honestly had no idea of a Canadian society. Although I had a good sense of Canadian politics, economy, and immigration, however, a limited understanding of indigenous societies, their cultures, and their histories, I acquired most of the knowledge here in UBC by participating in indigenous events, going to their music concerts, art exhibitions, and of course, trying Canadian First Nation cuisine. Do try that. However, in the recent past, unfortunately, 
we have witnessed deadly expressions of racism, hate crime against racialized groups, to name but a few blacks, Asians, indigenous and Muslims. And how can we forget those hundreds of unmarked graves of indigenous children that have been discovered in the past weeks? Anti-racism activism and academic dialogue across UBC encouraged all of us to raise our voices against this prevalent discrimination. In addition to that, I keenly participated in equity, inclusion, mental health workshops in order to be part of a community that is working towards creating a positive and respectful space in our day-to-day -day academic work life. So as a message to our newcomers, I would strongly encourage you to look for such opportunities, such events, talks, activities where, where you not just only learn about indigenous societies, uh, cultures, and the contemporary society and racism or anti-racism, rather where you explore yourself and think, and then think what contribution you can make in this ongoing effort of making this world beautiful and habitable. Thank you.